I like waiting at the bus stop and taking my familiar 32 bus. It's comforting somehow. Everybody thinks that I'm slightly bizarre for doing that. I don't drive a nice car. I don't wear fancy clothes. I don't live in a big flashy place. I live my life for Singapore Ballet. I've given the company a lot of my own personal money because I love them. For over 30 years, Yannick Shergan has given his all to this, the artists and the artistry of Singapore Ballet. Under his director's eye, they have flourished, with annual events like Ballet Under the Stars bringing the magic of masterpieces like Swan Lake to the everyday Singaporean. But things weren't always like this. In the 1980s, almost anyone who dreamed of pursuing dance as a career found it unsustainable. There just weren't enough opportunities locally for professional dancers, which is why the Singapore Dance Theatre was founded. Yannick was there at its birth 36 years ago, and he has since helped it grow and mature into a respected company, now called Singapore Ballet, capable of taking on world-class choreography. But another reason I'm personally keen to meet the Swede is because our paths actually crossed many years ago. Hi! Hi, Yannick. Hi. Lovely to meet you. Welcome to my house. Thank you. It's gorgeous. Come on in. I'm not sure whether you remember, but I met you years and years and years ago when I got pulled in to host for one of the editions of Ballet Under the Stars. I do remember. I'm curious about how you entered dancing life. So tell me about your early years. I come from a very interesting family in the fact that everybody is essentially somehow related to the arts. Mm. My grandfather was in a symphony orchestra. My mother had danced. It was considered to be the highest possible achievement to be involved in the arts. When I was about 14, I thought, if I don't become a dancer, I will never be happy. I'll never be who I'm supposed to be. Tell me about your first professional job working in ballet. You either went to New York or you went to London. Okay. Those were the two big places to go study. I auditioned for a company that was in Canada mm -hmm. called Royal Winnipeg Ballet. Mm -hmm. And uh, a dancer can do like 20, 30, 40 auditions. Mm -hmm. My first audition, I got it. Wow. And uh, they offered me a contract when I was 19 years old. But it seemed that Roe Winnipeg and I weren't a great match. I didn't want to do full-length classical ballet. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do things that were new. And so I, I searched around a bit, and I was fortunate that a, there was a company in Philadelphia called Pennsylvania Ballet that was very, very, very prominent. And you were a repetiteur. So it's what somebody might think of as like a dance captain or like yes. a dance master. Yes. Wow, but in a fancy French too. In a fancy French. <laughs> it's very and uh, I became a prominent dancer in the company and I danced a lot of the repertoire. And, and then they noticed that I was good at remembering things. Yeah. And so I started helping with rehearsals. So slowly they started trusting me because I was known to be exceptionally accurate. Mm -hmm. And then I met Chusango. <gasps> Tell me about Chusango. Who is he? He was a renegade. He had a very unique style. He was extremely musical. His choreography was very distinctive. It didn't look like anybody else's. Okay. And he had just joined Washington Ballet as their resident choreographer. And you have to understand there had never been an Asian choreographer in ballet. Right. Ever. Right. After the word choreography, an Asian name had never been seen. And suddenly there was this buzz about this Chinese choreographer. And then he upset the whole trajectory of your life. He did. He made this proposal to me that, that I leave Philadelphia and go to Washington. Washington was a very young company at that point. It was only four years old. Mm -hmm. I was in one of the most established companies in America. And I went, why would I do that? Chusun sort of said, well, come for three days. <laughs> and so I went for three days. Then the next time I went for three weeks. Yeah. Then the next time I think I went for 11 weeks, maybe 13 weeks. Then I was splitting my year half and half. I became his rehearsal person. And so I worked alongside him for about seven years. Mm -hmm and we were also best friends. Chu San was also partially responsible for you uprooting your life again and coming to Singapore with the then known as Singapore Dance Theatre. The two co-founders of Singapore Dance Theatre, Madame Gosu Kim, who was Chu San's sister, mm -hmm. and Anthony Then, had seen Washington Ballet when we made trips here for the arts festival several times. And they had discussions with Chu San, 
and I was brought into the discussions. And so uh, Chusan's directive to me was help them get it started. So I was involved from the very, very, very beginning. Wow, and what was the original mission of Singapore Dance Theatre? Professional dance didn't exist here. Mm. And so if you wanted to see professional dance, it was a touring company that came in from overseas or some such thing. Miss Go and Anthony wanted professional level international quality performances presented by somebody that was based here, mm. a company that was based here, rather than always be outsiders. And something with an identity. So when you threw in your lot with him, is that something that you feel today was the right decision? I'm in Singapore, aren't I? <laughs> so, yes, you are. Up next, Yannick pulls back the curtains of Singapore Ballet and shows me his world. These are books on Benish notation. Rather than write things out longhand, I write half Benish, half English, so we call it Benglish. Benglish, like, like why Singlish. are you like that? <laughs> Benglish. Benglish. Benish movement notation. Very nice. Okay, so Yannick, this one. Five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yannick Shergan is a Swede who spent 36 years with Singapore Ballet. After helping with its setting up in 1988, he spent years shuttling between Sweden and here to teach its dancers before finally settling in Singapore in 2007 as its artistic director. Under his watchful eye, the fledgling dance company gradually found its international standing. When Singapore Dance Theatre was doing its first performances in 1988, the first ballet that they ever danced was a piece that I taught to them. I would come back every single year between 1988 and when I moved here full-time in 2007. They asked you to come on board to lead the Singapore Dance Theatre. How did that happen? Mm, <laughs> that's a very long question. Uh, they asked me if I could help the company steer through a particular moment in time. If we were to ask somebody else to do this who is unfamiliar with the organisation, it's going to take a long time. Right. And it hadn't been my intention. I wanted to get back to my life. Mm. I thought about it um, really, really, really hard because I had the feeling that if I took this on, it wasn't going to be a minor commitment. It was going to be the rest of my professional life. So you were only supposed to be with Singapore Dance Theatre for 18 months. Yes, that's what it was planned for. <laughs> and now you've stayed on for... 18 years. <laughs> <laughs> what made you say yes? Because I love this organisation. I, I, I knew the whole history of the company. There are a lot of people who become involved in companies mm -hmm. that have no attachment to the company's history. They become the director and they throw out everything. And I think that's a crime. I think that there's enough that we have done in our history that we can build upon. What did you feel was the biggest problem that you needed to address? I always thought it was a question of identity and long-range planning. Since the two co-founders were Singaporean, it was an easy way to say, well, it was founded by two Singaporeans. I don't think that was enough. I thought the only way to do that was long-range planning, to build the company, develop something that was substantial, a little bit more ambitious, a little bit more headed in a certain direction. Singapore Ballet has done 31 world premieres and 19 company premieres. The copyright holders will come in and evaluate to see whether Singapore Ballet is good enough to essentially hold that torch. You have to show them that you're going to represent the choreography that they hold to the best standard. You have to purchase the rights to be able to do that ballet. Then you have to bring the person to teach the ballet. Then you have to pay per diem and royalties and all of those things. And then the music. I mean, if you want a ballet from a well-known choreographer, you have to ask them at least 18 months to 24 months in advance because their year is booked up. Why do they want to work with us as opposed to some other opportunities? As a choreographer said, the ballet I see in my mind that I want to achieve, you, you're able to, to produce. Our dancers are able to achieve that. With all that talk making me curious to see where he works, I ask Yannick to show me around Singapore Ballet. And we take the bus, of course. 
So 18 years of taking the bus, you must have saved some money. So you're one of the, the most significant donors to the Singapore Ballet. You know, that's support of something I love. There are a lot of people who told me that I shouldn't do that. The whole concept of philanthropy, whether you are giving to get something or whether you are giving for something. And I always think that I am giving for something. I'm giving for the dancers, for the, the company, for the establishment of the repertory. Have you ever taken a cab? I'm not that keen on cabs. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I, I mean, I have a little credit card for the cab. OK. They came to me the other day. They said, there's a cab charge. Was that you? <laughs> I said, yeah, actually, I did take a, a taxi that like, day. Once a year once, yeah. <laughs> as a treat. <laughs> Welcome to Singapore Ballet. This is our building. We've been in here since 2013. This is the founder studio. This particular setup is the size of the Esplanade stage so that when we mark it out and then we transfer rehearsals from here, there's the least amount of adjustment. And then we get into the dancer's lounge, <laughs> yes, which is their please. break room, which I try to enter as little as possible. Why? Because they need their private space that's away from us. OK. All of the dancers' tables along there, they're the smaller tables. So mm -hmm. they refer to this as HDB, and that is landed property. Wonderful. <laughs> and they're very territorial. And, and if a dancer leaves and there's an empty spot, it's almost up for bids. Right. You know, who claims it? This is the Chusan Go studio. I really love working in this studio because I find it has a very special energy. And the fact that it's named after my best friend. This one's called the fishbowl <laughs> because you can see from all different areas. The dancers all joke that I have an obsession about chairs in the studio. <laughs> okay. We're here to work. We're not here to sit. <laughs> I see no chairs in there the studio. Are, well, there's the bench. Okay. <laughs> for your, for bench you. is for me. <laughs> <laughs> I deserve it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so this is wardrobe, and this is the fun place. OK. In this room, there is about $5 million of effort. What? Yeah, because each of the costumes, we figure that the cheapest costume we ever make mm -hmm. is about $400. The most expensive can cost up to $8,000. Coming up, I discover the softer side of Yannick that only a few people know. I'm at Singapore Ballet with its artistic director, Yannick Schergen. A consummate professional who's put his soul into his art, he is, ironically, still somewhat of an enigma. So I need to find out more, beginning with one of Yannick's comrades in arms. So Christina, you've been known more as a contemporary dancer. So how did you meet this artistic director of Singapore Ballet? I was on a double-decker bus, so it was a little noisy, and I just picked up a phone call. He introduced himself, and I, I sort of went, who? <laughs> he had seen a piece of my work on video, and he invited me to do a choreographic workshop. And then we kind of developed for a while a mentor mentee relationship. Now I would say it's a bit more of a friendship. You seem a bit dubious. <laughs> would you say you're friends? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you know, I'm not sure how you would categorize it. It might also be like a somewhat parental relationship, but okay. it fits both ways. Sometimes when we go to watch shows together, people will say, oh, your daughter. It's a joke. Where people crack this joke all the time. Would you like to sit next to your daughter? You've also seen how he evolved the Singapore Dance Theatre into Singapore Ballet. How will you say that he's changed this company? The first is developing local talent, mm. like myself. The number of Singaporean dancers has been higher and higher and higher than ever before. We finally had a lot of Singaporean soloists. And then the second would be, I think, how you expose the local audience to different influences. And he is able to do that because he has overseas connections. Do you feel that the level of technical expertise has increased over these 13 years? Yes, definitely, of course. Yana actually teaches a lot more than the majority of artistic directors would, I think. He's in the studio a lot more, not just teaching, but also in rehearsal process, coaching with yeah. ballets. And I think it's really great. I see. Do you feel that he feels lonely sometimes? 
I don't think he would like to think of himself as lonely. I mean, the arts keeps him very engaged. He's Definitely, married to the arts. Yes, absolutely. He calls me his daughter, but really, this is his baby, the company. Because Yannick is home away from home, he doesn't have so much of that support system. So sometimes I am somewhat concerned for his social well-being. One of the homegrown young talents that Yannick helped develop is Timothy. He joined the ballet at the age of 20 under its Dance Scholars program and is now a soloist. How do you feel that Yannick has transformed Singapore Dance Theatre and now Singapore Ballet? I think he has in increased the number of performances that we do. He has increased the number of the roster of dancers, which in turn increases the potential of the works that we can do. We can do bigger works, we can sustain more productions just because we have a bigger pool of talent to, to draw from. So how do you feel that Singapore Ballet is like as a company for you? Yeah, I always like to say that we are a happy company and, and I do agree actually. I think in some companies, you know, the dancers of different ranks, they rehearse at different times. But for us, we're all together. We have lunch together, we take class together, we rehearse together, so we are all quite close. We have this uh, initiative called Made in Singapore where it showcases the work of our dancers slash choreographers. He opened up to the dancers, whoever wanted to choreograph, you know, we were given a chance. And uh, he has let me uh, develop this voice. And also for some small projects here and there, like we did a little NDP music video. So small little opportunities like this are things that, you know, we as dancers, we treasure because we don't get much opportunities elsewhere. Wow, so because of Yannick, you were able to go from dancer to now maybe choreographer? Yes, yes, I, I guess you could say that. I suppose it's no surprise to hear those who've been mentored by Yannick speak of him with such respect. But what about someone who knows him outside of all that, whose friendship with Yannick began, you guessed it, on a bus? I would bring young people to watch the shows. You know, I knew he was the boss man. And then I realised he was on the same bus as me. Oh! Yeah, going back after the concerts, he struck me as someone a little intimidating. Yeah. I decided just one day, probably I had a little bit more courage. I went up to him on the bus. Hi, um, you're, you're from Singapore Dance Theatre. So I was a little scared, um, wasn't quite sure how he would take to my approaching him. Yeah, but after the initial, oh, um, hello, uh, we got talking and um, it's like one of those continuous conversations that never really ends when he opens up. He's lovely to talk to and I count him as a very special friend. Oh. We pick it up whenever we're back on the bus together right. or see each other at the concert. So what topic are you on now? Always, always about Singapore Ballet. I don't know if he does anything outside of work because that's just so much of his life. I just feel his heart is so much bigger than what a lot of people know. One thing that really strikes him is how Singapore doesn't take as much note mm. of our Singapore Ballet as much as perhaps, you know, even those outside of Singapore do. And when he talks about it, there is this sadness that comes through as well. You know, I, I can't imagine um, him moving away permanently from Singapore because in my mind, he is so much a part of the art scene here. Looking back, do you ever think about what your life could have been had you not decided to uproot your life and move here to head SDT? What do you think? <laughs> mm, <but> sometimes. <laughs> yes, I do. What is the greater thought? is what a privilege this is. Everything that I did in my life has led to this. Mm. And getting to help Singapore Ballet become what it is today is a reward that has no measure. Being transplanted to Singapore, how was that for you? Different. <laughs> I like the respect of other cultures. You know, not the absorption, mm. but the respect. I'm not Singaporean. I can admire, I can respect, I can dedicate, but I can't be anything other than a Swedish guy in Singapore. I'm very proud of Singapore. Going through Chisan, going through the establishment of Singapore Dance Theatre, what the two founders wanted to do, what I've helped to contribute. 
and part of me and my Swedish heritage made that possible. I understand that the Swedish have this concept called Jantalogen. Jantalogen. Do not. Okay. Jantalogen. <laughs> Jantalogen. <laughs> There are 10 sort of guidelines of how to conduct yourself as a person. That the individual is there to help society. That as an individual, you yourself are not the important thing. Contributing to society is the important thing. I tell the dancers that their responsibility is to represent Singapore Ballet. If they don't perform well, they're not letting themselves down, they're letting Singapore Ballet down. Does it ever get lonely? being in Singapore sometimes. Yes, of course I do. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course I do. I want to go back to Sweden for a while. And I haven't been able to do that. It is a frustration. I can feel it inside. It's like a little kernel in there going, I need to do this. I'm 71. I could probably keep going, but I don't think it's right. What I'm hoping to do is keep the company growing and then gradually sort of back away and let somebody walk in. And I can sit by a lake in Sweden. <laughs> or California, that's fine too. <laughs> <laughs> but Sweden will still be there. What I need to do is what's here right now. I want to be in Singapore Ballet Studios, in the theater, rehearsing them. That's all I want. Mm. The way some people want wealth and success and all of those things for themselves, I would really want that for this organization, for these dancers, for this company, for the development of this institution which exists in Singapore. Mm. Boy, I'd really want that.